And Jesus is uh, going to share something with his disciples that he's never shared with them before. And it's going to be, uh, it's going to be significant. When we read the scripture, you'll see that, in fact, is um, where we're going to go is they're going to be in a place called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is at the northern part of the uh, Jordan River. It's where the Jordan River actually begins. It's a town that was um, made, it was extravagantly decorated. There's a great temple there, a temple that's dedicated to pleasure and all things um, uh, along that line. But as we look at this story, we're going to go and take a great leap into, well, we have taken a great leap from Galilee now to Caesarea Philippi. If you were reading in the book of Luke or if you were reading in the book of Mark, there would be about mm, uh, be several, several hundred kilometers, as you could see, that Jesus went from Bethsaida. That's where we were last week. See how much time we can travel in a week here? From Bethsaida, they went up to Tyre and Sidon, and it's on, it's on foot. They've been walking and chatting and talking along the way. There are scores of events that have taken place between the feeding of the 5,000 now and where you find ourselves in Caesarea Philippi. But you see, for Luke, it's not so much the city or the placing. For Matthew and Mark, it was important that we know that they were in the Caesarea Philippi area. But for Luke, it's different. Luke has a different uh, perspective that he wants to bring out. And he shows how the disciples are now beginning to enter in to the private world of their master and Lord uh, Jesus Christ. So I'd ask you to turn your Bibles to the book of Luke. And chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, we went through 1 through 17 last week. We'll begin with verse 18 and go through verse 36. Now it happened. Just sounds like um, a fairy tale beginning, you know, I mean, and, and once upon a time. But it's, we have to understand that in Luke's, what Luke is doing is he's, putting these events together because he wants us to be convinced of who Jesus is. And that's where we're at. It's been nine chapters. We're finally getting to that. It's been 28 sermons, thereabouts. And Jesus, Luke is coming to the place now where he's really going to bring it down to home. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, that's what Jesus was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others said, Elijah. And others, that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And amazingly, notice this, verse 21. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. This is the first time that this has been mentioned. This is the first time that God's plan is put into words given to these disciples. Verse 23, and he said to all, if anyone should come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever should save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now about eight days after these things, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory, and the two men stood with him, who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. 
not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent. And no one in those days, uh, and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Only, no, only Luke notes that the disciples are now entering into the private world of Jesus. They have experienced the crowds. They've experienced the miracles. They've seen resurrections of people who were dead, raised to life again. There's been the teachings of Jesus. They've encountered his mighty spiritual power. Lots and lots of people have seen that. It's not been hidden. There's been crowds and crowds of people. But not all believe that Jesus is Lord. Not all believe that he's a Messiah. Not all. Some might believe that he's a shaman of some, uh, uh, of some uh, sort or some, uh, having some special abilities. Not everyone's convinced that he's going to be their Savior or Messiah. But Luke now, as these disciples have come closer, Jesus asks them this question. Luke associates their confession of Jesus as the Christ as being associated with Jesus in prayer. Think about that for a moment. Can you imagine what it would be like to be kneeling next to Jesus when he prays to his Father? It's like, whoa. Can you imagine as he begins to pour out his heart as a father and a son who are in a very close relationship, and, and he just, he's, he's talking to, to his Father and, and these disciples, I, I promise you they've never heard anything prayed like this before. It's not the kind of prayers that they would have heard in the temple growing up. In the temple, the prayers were recited. It wasn't something that was uh, spontaneous, but now they, they, they are close to Jesus, and they're hearing as Jesus is in conversation with his Father. What an incredible impact that may have been. And Luke makes the point in, in associating this experience now with the answers they're going to give to the questions. In seeing Jesus in this, in this private way and in this, in this spiritual relationship with his Father, his disciples are impressed, so impressed, that when they're asked, they know who Jesus is. So Jesus asks two questions. Two questions. So I guess it's uh, <clears throat> too early to begin talking about tests, right? Uh, in a few weeks, uh, your kids are going to be going, oh, I got a test today. Uh, no test today, okay? <clears throat> but uh, some important questions. Actually, there is a test. There is a test. Two questions. Only one counts. The first one, the disciples, you know, they've just got done feeding these 5,000 people. And Jesus says, who do the crowds say that I am? Who do the crowds say that I am? As they're going about, they're feeding the people with the fish, and the people are going, whoa, how did this happen? They're eating bread and fish that comes from five loaves and two fishes. I don't know if they knew how it came about. I don't know if the disciples, as they're, as they're distributing it, saying, this is from a little boy's lunch that he brought today. It's all we had. I don't know how, what the conversation is. But as they're eating, they're wondering. They've been hearing what Jesus is teaching. They came and they ran there to meet Jesus as he got to the beach. They spent the day there listening to him. Now they're being fed. They're making comments. They have ideas. They're wondering. The disciples are hearing these things. So when Jesus says, what do the crowds say about me? They have an answer. They know that some are saying that he's John the Baptist, that even though John the Baptist was beheaded, now he's back. There's others that are saying that he's uh, Elisha, you know, that uh, he's a prophet of uh, uh, almost 900 years ago, and now he's back. Others are saying he's just, you know, he's, he's special, he's a prophet. We read last week about Herod, who also has seen what is going on here with Jesus, and, and he's wondering. And when Herod asked the question, who is this guy? It was the same thing. It was, maybe he's John the Baptist. Well, Herod didn't like that answer too well because he beheaded him. He knew where John the Baptist was. But the thing is this, in all the replies that were being given when the question was asked, who did the crowd say that I am? Nobody is saying, oh yeah, he's the Messiah. He's the Christ. They all had other answers. It hasn't come to them yet. So now Jesus is bringing this up. The first question that he asks is a setup. You know what I mean? Have you ever been set up like this? Somebody says to you, hey, what are you doing this Saturday? 
You're going, uh, nothing planned, you know. And they go, good, man, can you come help me move? <laughs> what are you going to say? <laughs> you, you just got set up, you know. And, uh, you can, oh, yeah, no, man, uh, my kids got practice today. I forgot. And so it's kind of a set-up question here. Pastors are really good at this. Pastor will come in and say, are you, are you busy? You know, you got something you're doing? You go, oh, no, I'm fine. And then they'll say, hey, listen, I got a job for you. I want you to come teach Sunday school. I did that to Dan Robinson six years ago. <laughs> and uh, he's, still, he's still doing Sunday school for us. <laughs> so watch out when the pastor asks a question. Pause. Wait. What's the second question, you know? <clears throat> so the real question is, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? You know, Jesus really doesn't care what we know about others and what they say. We may know the different religions. We may know the different philosophies. But there's coming a day when Jesus is going to ask us the question. And I promise you, if you say, well, this is what Pastor Homer believes about it. He's going to say, no, 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 no. I really don't care what Pastor Homer thinks. I want to know what you think. I want to know what you think. Who do you say that I am? You see, when we stand before Jesus, that is our question. How do we answer that? Who do you say that Jesus is? This is a question that determines our destiny and eternity. Who is Jesus? So let's look quickly then at why Jesus might ask this question. Because he's, again, he, he set them up with a question. They answered it. Peter's answer was, you are Christ. You, you, are, you are God the Christ. You are God the Christ. And, and the word Christ, we need to remember, is sometimes we call Jesus Christ, we think Christ is his last name. Christ is not his last name. Christ is who he is. Christ means Messiah. Christ is the Greek uh, word for the Hebrew word Messiah. So they're saying that you are Christ the God, God the Christ. They know who he is. Everyone, because we, we come here, we have to understand that we oftentimes come to this with some wrong ideas and some wrong assumptions about who we are and who Jesus is and our relationship to him. And I, I just want to look at four of these things very quickly because as I was looking over them, and let me tell you, I I got these ideas from somebody else, so let me just make that uh, very clear, so I don't, you don't, you don't, I'm not taking claim for coming up with these great assumptions that we make. But this really gris, grabs, uh, grabbed me. Everyone wants a Savior, but only a few can accept a Lord. Everyone wants a Savior, but only a few can accept a Lord. And here's how I've always done evangelism. Hey, man, how'd you like to know how you can go to heaven when you die? What a setup. What are you going to say? Oh, no, man, I don't, I, don't, I don't care for that stuff. Some people do. But, you know, I mean, who, who, would rather go to, who would rather go to hell than go to heaven? So we ask the question. This is a common evangelistic approach. Would you like to know you can go to heaven when you die? Would you say no? Most of us wouldn't. We'd say, yeah, yeah, tell me about it. Well, the thing is, that's not the question. I, I don't know, as I was reading through this, how, how we so missed the point. Look what uh, Jesus says here. When we look in, um, he says here, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. How have we so missed the point? How have we so missed what Jesus is saying. While we are trying to sell this world a savior, a ticket, you can put it in your back pocket. It's your free passage to heaven. It's your free ticket out of hell. And so we're busy saying, we're trying to give you a savior. We're trying to convince you you need a savior because if you don't get a savior, you're going to go to hell. And Jesus is saying, that's not even the question. No wonder we see so few people who, where Christianity really makes a difference in their life, where their life is actually changed. 
I, I've told this before, but it, it always comes back to me. I went to a Christian college, Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California. It's a good school, in case you're interested. But, uh, and there was a whole lot of guys like me who called themselves Christians there, whose parents sent them to a Christian college because they knew it was going to be good for them. And again, I, I, I think it's a good idea. But man, he was a wild hare, wild hare. I liked him because he was a wild hare, and I liked <laughs> and uh, we would be wild together. But I said to him, I said, hey man, how come, how come you, can, you can do these things and call yourselves a Christian, call yourself a Christian? He goes, no problem, man. I'm covered. God's grace. God's grace is free. It's all under grace. You know what he was saying? I have a Savior, but I don't have a Lord. I have a Savior who's given me a ticket to do what I want to do, and I can get to go to heaven on top of that. I'm sorry, folks. We've missed it. That's not where the message is. In fact, Jesus offers this. Give me your life. Give me your life, and I will give you life in return. I will give you my life in return. We're going to see that as we look at this, we've made some wrong assumptions about our salvation and what it means. Jesus is not saying, hey, I'm just going to, hey, come along, fine. guys, we're going to have a great time. Uh, you got your ticket to roll? Let's roll, man. Let's, let's have a great time. So we, we've made this wrong assumption. And so that's why Jesus asked the question, who do, you, who do you think I am? Who do you say that I am? Secondly, notice this. Jesus asked this question because he knows that our focus is more on this world than on heaven. Our focus is more on this world than on heaven. You know, that's true, isn't it? When I got up this morning, my thoughts, my first thoughts weren't, Oh, man, I can hardly wait. I'm getting to heaven. No, my thought this morning is, oh, boy, it's Sunday, and i got to preach very soon. And so I said, i got to pray. i got to get right here. i got to read my Bible, and i got to go over this thing. Why? I live in a real world here, don't you? We live in a real world. And here's how we pray. Our prayers are, Jesus, this world's messed up. Fix this world up for me, will you? Make this, light, make this world a pleasant place to live. Jesus, solve my problems. Because we're too caught up in this world. We're praying and asking God to make heaven on earth here. And that's not what God's here to do. We want this instant gratification. You see, Jesus offers us eternal bliss after this life. But we try to negotiate with Jesus for a better life here. And he tells us, life on this earth is just a vapor. Poof. A vapor of steam. Look how much value we put in a vapor. And how we work so hard in this life to get gratification now. And Jesus says... I, I've given you heaven, eternal bliss, a few years, 70, 80, 90 years, and it's over. 90 years compared to eternity. What are we thinking? We're like little children who want what they see right now. It's almost dinner time, and there's a stale cookie that's been out all day on the counter, and they want oh, I want this cookie now. And you go, no, 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 no. We're going to have dinner in just a bit. You'll love the dinner. And we'll have a great dessert after. No, no, no. I don't want it now. I want the cookie. It's stale. It's been out all day long. It's soft and mushy because of all the humidity. But they want that cookie now because it's there. And isn't that the way we are? We want it now. And may I say this? In our culture today, especially amongst our young people and the teaching and the, and the attitudes and the, even the philosophy of teaching our children. We teach our children uh, um, that, um, about sex and about the relationships. We say, there's no need to wait. Why, you can't control your hormones. Try it out now instead of waiting for the bliss of marriage and what God has in store. We can't wait for heaven. And so we ask Jesus, give me a heaven on earth now. And he didn't die on the cross. He didn't die on the cross to give us heaven here. It's a false assumption. So we also go on, and we realize 
We focus more on ourselves than we do on others. Well, honestly, we all understand this, don't we? I mean, I raised a family. I know what it's like to get up every day and to go about my business raising a family. It's my family. I provide my house for them. This is my kingdom. I rule. I have my children's subjects here. And um, I make uh, everybody knows that the queen rules, though, right? <laughs> Yeah, but I get to make her queen. I get to choose her, too. So, you know, it's, and this is how we live our life. We, it's, it's, it's so uh, inwardly looking. We think, well, you know, I've earned this. I deserve it. I get to spend it. I can do whatever I want to. After we've taken care of all of our needs, we give a little bit here and give a little bit there, and we call it extreme giving. But we come first. We come first. And God knows that about us. God knows that about us. And that's why he asks us this question. Who do you say that I am? Because it flies in the face of everything that we've taken so much for, for granted that we've assumed. The bottom line is this. God is not about me. God is not about just my world. He didn't come to die on the cross to save me so I would have a wonderful time. He came to save us, save us so that we can tell others that goes against our very core beliefs because we think it's about us. And then he says this. It, well, he doesn't say it. It's an assumption that we have. We want Jesus to bless us rather than use us. This really hit home to me because I know how I pray. And I'm always praying, God bless me in this work. God bless this B1 project. God bless this. God bless that. Instead of saying, God, would you use me? We much prefer to have God's blessings. It's, our, it's not wrong to, be ble to, to want God's blessings. But when our desire to be blessed is much stronger than our desire to be used, we have a wrong understanding here. Our assumption is wrong. When our prayers are all about blessing me, blessing what I'm doing, rather than saying, God, please use me, I have a wrong understanding of God. Again, Jesus did not die on the cross so he can be my go-to guy for the blessings. Hit in the rough patch here, God. I need you to bless me. Jesus goes against the idea that the Messiah, that the Christ has come to give his people what we want. We, we honestly listen as we pray. We, it's like God's my... He's my provider in the sky, you know. I need this and I need that. And please bless me for this and bless me for that. I, and, and folks, when I'm saying this, I'm not pointing any fingers at anybody. I'm pointing at myself. You have your fingers to point at yourself. And the thing is, is that we, we have to understand. Here's what Jesus said. Let me read it to you again. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Is that our core fundamental belief? Is that a statement of faith for us? Is that how we've invested in this faith in Jesus? I I'm saying to you, we read this and we, I mean, we can read through the Bible and look at all the nice things, but there's just, there's just some things that, they're hard. They're hard. They, they convict, they convict me. And to come and to think, well, all right, Jesus, what does it mean now? What does it mean to take up your cross? I've heard it said that if you're not willing to be crucified on a cross for Jesus, you're not worthy to be saved. I've, I've heard that said. But I thought, you're right. Even if I thought that I could be pinned up on a cross and was, I'm still not worthy of it. I mean, you know, that doesn't make me worthy just because I want to be pinned on a cross like Jesus was. The fact is, I'm not worthy any way you look at it. That's why Jesus came and took our place. That's why Jesus came 
and died on the cross for us. And because Jesus took my place and died on the cross for me, that means, that makes me, that I, I want to be willing to humbly yield my life to him because he's done that for me. But Jesus says, take up your cross. What does he mean by that? It doesn't mean that we're to crucify ourselves. It does mean that there's a yielding to Jesus. A yielding to Jesus. Here's how we picture that today. And this is why, to me, uh, this baptism thing, baptism doesn't save you, but baptism is a powerful picture. It's a powerful picture to, to the world. And what we're saying is this. We're saying when we put a person down into the water, you're buried. Your old life. You die to the old life. You die to your old ways. You die to the old spirit. You're raised up again to a newness of life. Baptism is important. It's a powerful statement of saying, I'm yielding my life to Jesus. It's no longer I who live, but the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what Paul was saying when he says, I'm crucified with Christ. He's not saying that they pinned each other to the cross like that. He's saying, I'm making a radical statement. It's not my life to live. The life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. It's dying to this world, rising to a new life in Christ. Notice also the reason I know it doesn't mean taking up a cross is because he's saying... It's a picture of self-denial. Jesus says it's a matter of denying ourselves. That's the key. It's the self-denial. When Jesus tells us to deny ourselves, he denied himself. Let me ask you a question. And, and, and again, um, if you've been in Sunday school a lot, we probably don't deal with these questions in Sunday school, and I don't think they're going to deal them with you, with with your children in Sunday school, just because if we did deal with some of these things in Sunday school, your children would come home crying every day or every week. But think about it. Jesus, he, he knows he's got to go to Jerusalem and go to the cross. Do you think Jesus wanted to go and die on the cross? Do you think he's saying, whoopee, I'm going to Jerusalem. They're going to crucify me on the cross. Let's go, guys. Not at all. Not at all. Sometimes we lose his humanity in this, and we just think, oh, you know, it's just it's what he came to do. He's the Lamb of God. I mean, he knew what was going on. Come on, folks. Who wants that? Have you noticed that, that when, you, when you die on the cross, it's only once? Jesus says, take up the cross daily, doesn't he? How does that happen? It's a daily decision. It's not a one-time prayer. Not a one-time prayer. Although I would say the one-time prayer in which we make our commitment to Jesus, it's the beginning step. I don't believe that just because a person says a prayer that, poof, automatically, it's all done. There's a, there's a walk. There's a cross. There's something to carry. There's a life to live. The beginning of that journey, it's a beginning. It's not a finish. And every day we wake up, we want this world to be about our kingdom, our world, making our life better. That's why it's important every day that we wake up. Paul says this too. He says, I die daily. If we don't, if we don't, you know how it is, especially if you have children. They wake you up out of a sleep, and all of a sudden you're back in the real world again. You don't have time to kind of collect your thoughts, but it's, it's important for us to be able to say, God, let me be used by you today. Let me not be consumed with myself, but what you've given me here to do, the work, the vocation, the, the, the opportunities, and, and the people I meet, let this be for you. Use me for you. Again, it goes against our core, doesn't it? This is not something, oh, pastor, this warms my heart. It doesn't warm my heart. It convicts me very deeply. That we can get so accustomed with these things and we not stop to think about what is being said here when he says, take up your cross. Every day we want this world to be about us. And we need to daily practice self-denial. That goes so against 
all our culture tells us about self-affirmation. Daily we pick up the cross because we can't save ourselves. Daily we pick up the cross because we want to acknowledge I'm not my own. This is not my kingdom. I'm in his kingdom. And when we even say the Lord's Prayer, if we would just say the Lord's Prayer daily, not my will but thine be done. Whoa, stop, stop. What's your day going to look like when we pray that way? What's our way of thinking going to look like? What do we really think about Jesus? And then when he says take up your cross, it's, it's humbly accepting what our assignment is, what our commission is. What was Jesus' assignment? He tells us. He was telling his disciples for the first time. Here's what he says. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes. He'll be killed and on the third day be raised again. The cross was given to Jesus for our salvation. The assignment that God gives to us, that Jesus gives to us, is that he might use us for others to be saved. Or, you know, we do have a choice. We do have a choice. And you might be glad to know there is a choice. You don't have to take up the cross. In fact, is we don't even have to be related to Jesus. We don't have to go down that road. We can actually say, I want what all this world has to offer. I want it. I would rather have it now than wait till later. I'll take my chances on it. It's our choice. You may have heard that choice before. That was the same choice that Satan offered to Jesus, and it's Satan's offer to us. Don't, don't, I mean, heaven, it's pie in the sky by and by. Make your heaven here. Make the best of what you can here. The exchange with Jesus, make no mistake about it. Make no mistake. The exchange with Jesus is this. Your life for mine. Your life for mine. You give me your sin. I'll give you my righteousness. He goes on, he says in Luke chapter 9, verse 25, For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. And from here, the scriptures tell us that eight days later they climb this mountain. They go up to the top of the mountain there. There's Jesus, Peter, John, and James. And while Jesus is praying, notice again, again, this is in Luke. While Jesus is praying, something happens. We catch a glimpse of the glory of God. In Luke, he says it turns a dazzling white. In another version of the Bible, it says it becomes like a flash of lightning, blindingly bright. And in Mark, it says that his clothes were so white, bleach can't make them any whiter. I guess that's white. But it's just dazzling. It's, it's amazing. It's overcoming. And so we get to see a very brief glimpse of the deity of God shine through Jesus. You, you know, here's the thing. We, we, we've been studying Jesus for 28 weeks now, nine, nine, nine chapters. The amazing thing to me is this, that in this time we've been studying Jesus, we've never seen this. That's the miracle. How is it? that God is able to wrap himself in human flesh and keep from busting out and keep from saying, I am through with this. I want to go back and be God again. He denied himself. When he says to us, you need to deny yourself, Jesus has been there. He knows what it's like. He's not asking anything more of us. And all through this ministry that he's had to this point, he's amazingly kept himself wrapped. When we're up on the mountaintop, we notice there's two heavenly visitors, Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah meet with him, and Moses represents the law. Elijah represents history. So we have the law and history. The two of them are brought together here. As these two meet together, all of the testaments points to this one when they come together. And Peter then steps up. Moses, Elisha, and Jesus are having this conversation with these visitors here. And uh, I don't, I mean, it'd be pretty amazing what Moses, Jesus, and Elisha are talking about. But I'll tell you, the Bible tells us what they're talking about. They're talking about Jesus' departure in Jerusalem. 
They're saying to Jesus, Jesus, we're here because everything about our life as the law and history was about you. Everything was about telling you, uh, was saying, you're the one to come. You're the Messiah. You're the Savior. You're the Christ. Everything was pointing to that. Now here we are, and here you are, and your road's taking you to Jerusalem, and it's going to the cross. It's going to the cross. And in this brief moment, Jesus shows us he's God with his dazzling revelation of his glory. And now with this conversation with these two, Moses and Elisha. Why is that? I believe it's because Jesus does not want to die. Not that he's afraid of death. It's the cross. It's the cross. So, Peter, Peter, the fisherman, enters in. And the Bible tells us that they were, they were, their eyelids were heavy with sleep. They were really drowsy, like many of you are right now. And I, we're almost done. And uh, think about it for a moment. I mean, here's Moses, Elisha, and Jesus. And Jesus was praying, and now he's, and they're getting ready to leave. And, and, and Peter uh, wakes up, and, and he, I mean, he comes alert, and he steps up, and he goes, Hey, wait, Master, Master, this is cool. Let's stay here. Let's make a tent for Moses, Elisha, and Jesus. Bam, right there. It's amazing. This, the writer, I guess it's Luke, puts in a parenthesis and he says, wait, he doesn't know what he's saying. He doesn't know what he's saying. Isn't that so much like Peter, foot and mouth, not fish and mouth? I'm Jesus is going to Moses and Elisha. He's going, hey, it's the best we could find. Give him a break. <laughs> but you know what Peter just did? He put Moses, Elisha, and Jesus on the same level. He didn't know what he was saying. He didn't know what he was saying. And just at that time, this cloud descends. Must have been ominous. <laughs> cloud descends on the mountain, a really thick cloud that was bright. And they were enveloped in it, and they were filled with fear. And out of this cloud comes this voice. And this voice says, this is my chosen one. God shows up. This is my chosen one. This is my son. Listen to him. Listen to him. And there it is again. We talked earlier about what Jesus was saying. When he was saying, do you hear? Do you hear? And God now is saying, you better hear what the son has to say. He's my chosen one. So let me just finish quickly with a couple of things. First is this. To, uh, stop asking Jesus to be part of your life. Stop asking Jesus to be part of your life. Don't do it. Jesus will not be part of your life. He's not looking for partnerships. You see, here's the thing. Jesus came, comes as our Savior, but you cannot have a Savior without having a Lord. Because the Savior comes as what? The Lamb of God? What does He do? He redeems us. He pays the price for our sin. By redeeming us, He buys us back. When He buys us back, He becomes our owner. That means slavery, yeah? Huh? Now there's an uncomfortable term, folks. That's something that we have a real hard time with because we're nobody's slave. And Jesus says, I'm Lord or I'm not. But this is not a partnership. We have to ask ourselves, who do you say Jesus is? Is he Lord or is he merely our ticket to heaven, a get out of hell free card? One of the things we've forgotten, folks, is Jesus gets this fuzzy, soft kind of thing. But he's God. Have we forgotten the fear of God? He's God the Son, the only Lamb. He comes in the physical manifestation as Jesus. The next thing is... What is the next thing? Yes. 
There it is. Settle in your heart who Jesus is. Settle it. Settle it. Figure it out. And, 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 and make it sure and certain. Don't be waffling on Jesus. And this is something that from now on, Jesus is going to ask his disciples over and over again. Who am I? What do you know about me? And he'll tell them, here's the plan. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be killed, put on a cross. I'll raise again on the third day. Over and over, he tells them, they don't get it. He's not there to, to make his people happy. He's God. And so I would say this to you. Come to Jesus. Make him the Lord of your life. Submit to him. I know that I've talked about giving Jesus the steering wheel of your life. No, don't, don't just give him the steering wheel while you sit on the other side. Give him the whole car. <laughs> give him the whole life. Not only the steering wheel, but the motor, the brakes, the passenger seat, the whole thing. Give it all to Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, you, you, uh, well, you made things pretty clear. And as you were talking to your disciples there, you told them clearly what it's going to be. And Lord, as we come before you today, we've seen your plan take place. You told your disciples your plan, and now we look back at the fact that you were crucified for our sins. You did die. You were buried. You rose again the third day. But God, please help us to remember it isn't just so we can have a pleasant life here. You're the Lord of our life. You've promised us an eternity forever with you. But we're here that we might be your emissaries, that we might be your servants, indeed, that we might be your slaves. And honestly, Lord, if we're going to be slaves, I want to be your slave. I want to be your slave. Help us, Lord, to take a stand for you. Unequivocally, I stand for you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.